Hello again, fellow time travellers. Uh, here we are to contemplate history. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've heard me say this once, you've heard me say it a thousand times probably, but I find that history helps to keep me sane. Uh, increasingly I feel I'm holding on to the outside edge of the spinning disc of sanity uh, by my fingertips. Uh, but it's paying attention to history that, that I don't know, gives me something to believe in. Uh, apart from anything else, I'm a big believer in ancient wisdom. I'm, I'm just, a, I'm a big believer that that certain stories have have lasted, have been passed down for thousands of years, because they they have something of the truth about them. Uh, you know, we don't remember. People don't bother to remember and repeat and retell things that are unhelpful. People remember and maintain stories because they work. They have something in them. I, I think so. It's, you call it history, call it ancient wisdom. I don't know, but I, I find people have worked things out for us, and we can we can take advantage of their experience. Uh, as well, I always want to say thanks to everyone who contributes to this. Uh, genuinely, we've been both been struck by uh, seeing the comments and the people get in touch with each other via the you know the the, the, the hub of of the channel. And, and so it means that it has a life of its own and that's really, really satisfying. And, and also via the, the question and answers thing that we've started doing, it's great to get a conversation going. I like to feel that I'm in contact directly with, with some of you. Um, as always, it's worth pointing out that it's the Patreon presence that finances the rest of it. You know, the love letter to the British Isles and so on. Uh, if you aren't a member of Patreon and you'd like to become one, go to patreon.com, search for me by name. Um, you'll be talked through it and you know you part with some cash every month or for the year it's cheaper if you do it all in one go uh, that's my only tip um, you get access to vodcasts and quizzes and special editions and the Q&A's and all the rest of it and you get access to each other uh, you, you, you begin to see uh, what other people are saying about the topics ok uh, that's it that's enough of the self promotion it's time to strap yourselves into the time machine once more as we set off on the next stop on my love letter to the British Isles cue the music their mutilated bodies were hung up on the tower of St Michael's in a deliberate mockery of the crucifixion. In this podcast, we're travelling to a place swirling with myths and legends. An enchanted hill rising up out of the surrounding Fenland. A landscape full of magic and mystery. Joseph of Arimathea, Jesus' great uncle, is said to have buried the Holy Grail here. And in the 12th century, it's where monks claim to have discovered King Arthur and Queen Guinevere's coffin. Shimmering and shining with ancient traditions, history, beauty, and also some horror. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. In the last podcast we stood under a watchful red eye and you showed us a revolutionary document that help lay the foundations for democracy. Where are we now? This time we're at the other end of the Long Island, uh, in a place that revels in mythology and magic that, that spin and whirl around it. It's a landscape where the, the air is thick with ancient stories and history. It's somewhere that for the longest time has felt and still feels special. We're in Somerset at Glastonbury Tor. And can you tell me how this week's love letter fits into the Neil Oliver mythology? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked me that, Paul, because I've, I've said it before and I will say it again now, um, that in 2011, I was the warm-up act uh, for you two <laughs> at Glastonbury. <laughs> yes, yes, you did hear me say that. Um, 
uh, what, what actually happened was I had been um, asked to make a little film about Glastonbury that year and it went out as part of the package of coverage uh, by the BBC about the Glastonbury Festival that year, 2011. And it was all about the myths and legend of Glastonbury and it went out in a break. So my film finished and went back to the Radio 1 DJ Joe Wiley by the Pyramid stage and she said that I reminded her of um, Frank Gallagher. (laughs) Not good. The the hairy and disreputable patriarch of Shameless. Uh, Thanks for that, Joe. And then she introduced you two, who were the next act up. So after seeing me, the next thing that people around the world saw was uh, Bono and the Edge. (laughs) And I've been been sort of dining out on that ridiculous story for, uh, well, ever since, really. But it illustrates a point that Glastonbury, well, like nowhere else, or there's nowhere more wrapped up in myth and legend than Glastonbury. And people dismiss myths. They just write them off as fiction, you know, just like fairy stories. But the chances are, if you burrow down into a myth, the chances are you'll find some kernel of truth. You know, myths and legends don't start from nothing. It's like the little grain of sand or shell around which the nacre forms in an oyster that produces the iridescent pearl. And once the pearl's there, that's all you can see. You can't see what caused it to form in the first place, the little irritant inside the oyster shell. But if you were to drill into it, there it would be, the little grain of truth. So I, I use that story about about you two and, and, and the Glastonbury Festival because it, it's just a reminder when you heard me say I was the warm-up act for you two, you think, what a lot of stuff and nonsense. But I spun something that had a kernel of truth about it to make it sound like more than it was. But it wasn't entirely untrue. And I think that's just an important thing to bear in mind with with legend, with myth, with folklore, and especially when we consider Glastonbury. I'm sure some of the places that I'm talking about in the love letter to the British Isles are obscure. You've talked about St Nectan's Glen, Folk just won't have heard of it, chances are. But Glastonbury is absolutely on the world map because of the festival, but also because of the centuries of legend that have been spun around it. And it means that if you go, or when you go, it is a magical place. You can allow yourself to get a bit carried away. Have you been? Have you been to Glastonbury? Yes, a few times. I love it there. Uh, So you've seen the tour. You've seen Glastonbury tour. Yeah, which always has a bit of an ancient feel to me. Uh Uh-huh. And it's the oddest-looking thing. Broadly speaking, geologists and archaeologists, if there's consensus at all, they're more or less agreed that it's a natural feature in the landscape, that you're left behind by natural processes, glaciation, erosion, weathering, and all the rest of it. But there's no getting away from the fact that it looks very strange. It looks a bit more deliberate than that. It's got this tiered wedding cake shape. There's these sort of tiers around it, like steps getting higher and higher. And they're they're massive, but still from a distance, the thing looks sculpted. It always reminds me of a jelly mold. But some people have more recently suggested, believe it or not, we talked about Silbury Hill long ago, the largest man-made prehistoric mound in Europe, huge thing sits on a footprint of about 6 acres 150 odd feet tall man made and it's got that strange tiered wedding cake shape as well because it was it was built like a series of discs getting smaller and smaller as it got higher and higher well some people have suggested that the natural inspiration for Silbury Hill might have been Glastonbury Tor the, the Neolithic farmers were aware of the Tor because it had always been there maybe admired it, maybe invested it with some kind of significance because it it had this strange shape. Maybe they modified it, who knows? But there have been suggestions that they then went away and built their own one, which was Silbury Hill, so that there might be a connection between the two in that the one inspired the other. Wouldn't it be difficult for archaeologists to know for sure if it was constructed or natural? It would be. I mean, it has some of the look of, like, terraces. You know, sometimes in places like in the Andes where the Incas put those places where they could grow crops, even on the steepest slopes, they have some of the look of that. It almost looks like people have created these artificial terraces around it. 
but there's no consensus. Archaeologists and geologists have been talking about it and looking at it for the longest time. And the general consensus, which is not across the board by any means, is that it's a natural feature. Okay, so that's like the raw material, if you like, at Glastonbury. Let's let's take that as red. Let's take it that this natural feature appeared in the landscape. And that in itself had a bit of a magnetic draw for people. As it does today, so thousands of years in the past, it may have caught people's eye. And they may have begun to invest it with significance, to tell each other stories about it, because that's what people do. And it may just have become a place that people were coming to on a kind of a pilgrimage. At certain times in their lives or at certain times of the year, they may have made a point of going there. If you go to the the tour today, the other thing that's very distinctive about it, and people will have seen aerial photographs and aerial footage of it, there's this church tower on the top, pale stone, three stories high, and that's all that remains of a church, St Michael's, and it was there from the 11th century until about 1275, when apparently there was an earthquake, believe it or not, and the rest of the building fell down. And then it was replaced. And that replacement stood from the 14th century until 1539, when, during the the Reformation, hardliners came in, as they did everywhere, under the orders of Henry VIII, and tore places like that apart. Accusations of idolatry and all the rest of it. And it's this tower that stands defiant, you know, even after all the years, but it's very much part of what makes Glastonbury Tour the unique sort of visual experience that it is. And then you have to remember that Glastonbury Tour is is by Glastonbury, you know, the town that has grown up around it. And anyone that's been to Glastonbury, it's quite the place, especially in the summertime, or especially if you go there when the festival's on. You know, to say that you see colourful characters on the street is, you know, is only the half of it. And and there's all these shops selling dragon statues and crystals and for healing and people are wandering about smelling at exotic substances and it's quite the place. So you can tell that it's got a pool, but it's been that way for the longest time. A lot of people of a, of a certain age, certain younger generations will just associate Glastonbury with the music festival, which is fair enough. But it's important to remember that people have been pulled towards Glastonbury Tor for thousands of years. And, and, and there are explanations for some of it. In 1184, the local Benedictine Abbey that was there at Glastonbury was destroyed by a fire, okay? Now, the religious community there, the monks, set about creating for themselves a new abbey. What then happened? Well, let's just say what the monks say happened. While they were digging trenches for the new walls of the new abbey, they came across a piece of dressed stone which is to say a stone that had been shaped and smoothed by a mason. And underneath the stone, there was a lead cross and there was a little plaque on the lead cross inscribed in Latin, Hidiacet Sepulchus Inclitus Rex Arturius in Insula Avalonia. Now, please everyone forgive my butchered Latin pronunciation, but what that means is here lies entombed the famous King Arthur, in the island of Avalon. <laughs> right, so picture the scene. The monks, they say they're digging a foundation trench and this is what they find. A dressed stone and under it this cross with this inscription saying that King Arthur's buried here. And underneath the cross was a coffin. And not just any coffin, it was a coffin that had been created from part of an oak tree. It was like a dugout canoe, huge. And inside the coffin were two skeletons. One of a big man, and one of a a more slender, uh, gracile woman. So, here, the monks said, were the mortal remains of King Arthur and his Queen Guinevere, buried side by side. Maybe it was true. Who can say? But if it was a PR stunt, it was a particularly good one. And you've just got to decide for yourself what's been going on. Bear in mind that at that point, in the let's say in the 12th century, pilgrimage was popular. In the 20th and 21st century, people have liked going to Glastonbury on pilgrimage, but to see artists and musicians and all the rest of it. But in the 12th century and, and all, people were going to religious places to visit the relics of saints. It was a big deal. People got a lot out of it. Great social events, 
moving in procession through the landscape, meeting up with other pilgrims, arriving at destinations, going through all sorts of religious festivals and experiences. It was a big deal. And at the time of this momentous discovery by the monks at Glastonbury, the tomb of the martyred Thomas Beckett on the other side of the country, right over in Canterbury, his tomb, his remains had become a massively successful site of pilgrimage. And where pilgrims went, there was money. All along the way, you know, people are paying for food, paying for accommodation, and then when they turn up at the place, you know, there's, it's an industry. So Canterbury was doing very well off the back of the Thomas Beckett pilgrim industry. So there's no doubting that if the monks at Glastonbury could establish that they had the burial of Arthur and Guinevere, that they'd be on to quite the draw, uh, which they surely were. It became a very important and busy centre for pilgrimage. People started coming. And once the faithful started coming, they never stopped. And in 1278, King Edward I, that's the same King Edward that goes to war with William Wallace and Robert the Bruce and all of that. But King Edward came with his own queen, Eleanor of Castile. They came to Glastonbury to witness the reinterment, the reburial of Arthur and Guinevere beneath a stone plaque that's still there to this day. So even even royalty were attracted to a place like Glastonbury. And it's only to begin to scratch the surface, really. Even with all that, even the fact that the, that the monks of Glastonbury said they'd found Arthur and Guinevere is only a part of, of what's going on in that place. The story goes that just 20 years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Joseph of Arimathea came to Glastonbury. Now, Joseph of Arimathea was Jesus' great uncle. So here's someone who knew the man Jesus, who was alive at the same time as Jesus. And the folklore in Glastonbury, of course, is that Joseph of Arimathea came to Glastonbury more than once and that he brought the young boy Jesus, Jesus as a child, Hence the hymn, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's pastures green, is a direct reference to the traditional folklore that Jesus, the boy Jesus, was brought to Glastonbury. Because that part of the west of the Long Island of Britain was associated with the Druids. We've already encountered the Druids at Hlinvaur, the, you know, the Welsh lake where the hoard was recovered in the early part of the 20th century. Well, the west of Britain was very much associated with Druidry and the great wisdom of the Druids. And people from the ancient world may well have come to Britain to encounter the Druids, to get in touch with the learning and the knowledge and the wisdom that those people had. And the folklore has it that Joseph of Arimathea brought his great nephew. Let's go back then to the rest of the biblical story. Jesus is crucified and he's laid in a tomb. And according to some of the gospel, the tomb in which he's laid was owned by Joseph of Arimathea. So Jesus' body was laid out in a tomb that was part of the family property of Joseph of Arimathea. Then Jesus returns to life after three days and the stone rolls away and, and off we go. So then 20 years after the crucifixion, apparently, Joseph of Arimathea came to Glastonbury again and he brought with him, this is, <laughs> this is all great stuff, he brings with him the Holy Grail the cup. Now, the, the cup th th that's called the Holy Grail had featured at the Last Supper when Jesus had shared the wine and the bread with his disciples and, and had explained to them that whenever they reenacted this behaviour, that he would be with them. It was also, according to the Bible, the cup that was used to collect some of the blood and sweat of Jesus Christ as he hung dying on the cross. So this was a, a precious holy relic. And the legend has it that Joseph of Arimathea brought it to Glastonbury. And for safekeeping, he buried it at the foot of the Tor. And then, furthermore, uh, having buried the Holy Grail, he then walked with his staff onto the slope of a nearby hill called Weariall Hill. And near the top, he stuck his staff into the ground and magically it took root and began to grow. And the legend is that the Glastonbury thorn tree has grown there uh, ever since. It's of a particular variety called Crataegus monogyna biflora. And like all thorn trees, it, it flowers with a white flower in 
the summertime. But the Glastonbury thorn tree is of a species that flowers in winter by flora. It flowers twice. So it became a very potent Christian symbol because it was life in a time of dying. Here in the depths of winter, when everything else was dead, you could go to the, the thorn tree on the hill and it was in flower. So it symbolised the idea of life after death or the return to life, the resurrection. You know, so this is all happening in that one place. Joseph of Arimathea was a metal trader. Is that why he would have been travelling around the world? Well, it, well yes, it, well, that, that's an explanation for it. We already know the Phoenicians were coming out of the eastern Mediterranean 3,000 years ago and coming to Cornwall to get tin, one of the materials for which the, these islands were famous in the ancient world. We've talked about this in the love letter before, that if you wanted to make bronze, you needed tin and copper. And you could get both tin and copper in, in the British Isles. And tin is especially rare. And, and the richest source in the ancient world was probably Cornwall. So there was a well-known route out of the Mediterranean following the coastline of Western Europe until you got to the Tin Islands, which, which is how the, the British Isles were known for the longest time. And it may well be the case that the kind of ships that were coming in up the Bristol Channel and, and giving people access to somewhere like Glastonbury it may have been people coming in search of metal. And there, and there has been reasonable speculation that, that a figure like Joseph of Arimathea may have been familiar with our part of the world coming out of Palestine because he was in the habit of making the trip to get tin. I mean, it's a perfectly rational reason. And, and whether or not someone like that would bring younger members of his family to pick up a bit of druid wisdom. And the whole thing just gets curiouser and curiouser and, and more and more uh, captivating and magical because geologists have established that 2,000 years ago, back at the time of Jesus Christ and, and, and Joseph of Arimathea, Glastonbury Tor may have been, for part of the year, an island. You, you know, when you get to the, the notion of Avalon, you know, Arthur being buried on the island of Avalon, Glastonbury Tor may have appeared as an island for large parts of the year because before the advent of modern drainage, that low-lying land around the Tor may have flooded every winter and Glastonbury Tor may have been completely surrounded by water and there's an old Welsh name for Glastonbury Tor a much older name than Glastonbury Tor which is Innes Witren, which means, well, it means something like the island of glass but it may remember a time when that feature in the landscape was famous for sometimes looking like a, a shape plopped on top of a reflective mirror that's how it may have appeared for part of the year, and it may have been famous as that, which adds even more credence to the idea that people coming by ship and coming in to the Bristol Channel may have been able to penetrate further inland anyway. But it's perfectly reasonable to think about metal traders being familiar with the southwest of England. They surely were. They were coming to Cornwall for tin, and some of them would be going to Wales, to Llandudno and the rest of it, in, in search of copper. So, you know, there you go, like the pearl that, that I mentioned at the beginning, there's layers and layers and layers of iridescent pearl that have grown around something at Glastonbury. And you have to ask yourself the question, what started it? Is it the tor itself? Is it the strangeness of the physical appearance of that natural feature in the landscape? Does that explain it? And maybe it does. But certainly for centuries thereafter, People kept on coming. And then, of course, you get the aspect of early Christianity. Now, when it came to the fact that by the 12th century, the, the monks at Glastonbury were claiming Arthur and Guinevere, because of the Joseph of Arimathea story, they were able to claim that it was to them, to their part of the world, that the earliest version of Christianity had arrived in Britain. You know, it was all well and good, Canterbury Cathedral, Thomas Beckett and all the rest of it. But the Joseph of Arimathea story gives the idea, or gives the suggestion at least, that, that Christianity arrived at Glastonbury in the head and hands of someone who had known Jesus while he was still alive as a man. Talk about 
having a powerful claim on the arrival of a religion. The very suggestion that it had come, that it had been brought to Glastonbury by somebody who had known Jesus Christ in life, was a powerful bit of a story. And then there's all of that sort of shining brightness, all that intoxicating stuff in the in the Glastonbury story, but there's a darkness as well. When the Reformation came along, when the Church of England was being established under Henry VIII and Catholicism and, and its attendant imagery was being done away with, Glastonbury, specifically the church at St Michael, became a place of horror. On the 15th of November, 1539, the 80-year-old Richard Whiting, who was the abbot of Glastonbury, he was, he was dragged up, battered and beaten, up onto the summit of the Tor, and two of his brother monks were brought with him. And there he and they were hanged and drawn and quartered. Then their mutilated bodies were hung up on the tower of St Michael's in a deliberate sort of mockery of the crucifixion. So the abbot was there at the centre as the Christ figure and then his two brother monks, similarly mutilated, were hung up beside him. So there's a darkness, there's a darkness and a a terrible sadness and a a horror woven through the story as well. It's just all these details. You can you can well understand why there were enough ingredients to empower so much Christian mythology there. This species of, of thorn tree, Curtagus monogyna by Flora, so conveniently symbolic of a light in the darkness, of life in a time of dying. And there's even a spring. It's called the Chalice Well. Every day it produces 25,000 gallons of this strange-tasting, metallic-tasting, red-tinged water. Now, it's only on account of the... It's coming up through iron, iron ore in the rock, which is colouring the water and and giving it this... this, It's like if you were to put a a rusty nail in your mouth, you know, that metallic taste. That's what it tastes of. So this bloody red water... Now, bear in mind that the tradition has it that the, the Holy Grail, which held the blood of Jesus Christ, is supposed to be buried beneath the tor. Now there's blood red or tinged, red-tinged water flowing out. It all starts to fit together for people in a way that you can understand how having a profound effect on people of faith hundreds of years ago. And the, the water, the chalice well, it's surrounded by these ancient yew trees, which are also another potent Christian symbol because yew trees have remarkable regenerative powers. If you cut a yew tree off at the roots, it can regrow just from the roots. So again, it's like something that's been cut down like Jesus and then comes back to life. Even in times of drought, when other water supplies in Glastonbury had, had dried up and, and people might have gone for want of water, the chalice well never stopped flowing. So Glastonbury is just this extraordinary place. The, the Tor is a is probably natural. Maybe it's been modified, but it, it, in essence, it's probably this natural feature in the landscape that's eye-catching, that's probably drawn people and encouraged people to think and tell stories for thousands of years. It may have inspired the building elsewhere of Silbury Hill, mimicking its shape. And it may well have been a destination also for tin traders, metal traders, thousands of years ago, people coming and going, and also finding their way to that place, which sometimes was surrounded by water. It's a magical bit of landscape, it just is. If you imagine mist low, water around it, this this strange shape rising up out of the water, people would tell themselves and each other's stories about such a place. Then you've got the arrival of Christianity. There's Christian communities there, and they start either, either they're finding things in truth, or they're creating opportunities for themselves to get a bit of the pilgrim industry action. But it becomes it becomes this focal point that's associated forever with Arthur and Guinevere. And then there's the twice flowering thorn tree. There's the legend of Joseph of Arimathea and even Jesus himself. It's all there in that one place. It, it always puts me in mind of, you know, sometimes in the countryside, you know, you'll find a rusty nail hammered into a, a, a gate somewhere on a trail and all this sheep fleece has gathered around it you know, sheep fleece that has blown on the wind and it has all gathered on this one nail because the nail is there and all these wind-blown filaments have just collected and collected and collected. There's something of that at Glastonbury Tor. 
this place that lots of other ideas maybe carried on the wind have just caught, have caught at Glastonbury Tor. And now people are drawn. And it also has some of the feel of, in a different way, of a place like St Nectan's Glen. Because in essence, it's, it's natural. Glastonbury is not made by us, it's made by the world. It's a natural place in the landscape that is pleasing. It's got a pleasing look and a pleasing atmosphere. And maybe that's enough. But it's one of those places that people have and still revere as special. And it, it makes us question where we come from, what life might be about. And whatever else is buried there, whatever truly is buried there or not, Glastonbury Tor has a power to draw. It always has and it probably always will. When you walk in this ancient place through the town of Glastonbury and climb the Tor, what emotions does it stir in you? Oh, well, it's uh, Glastonbury, the town. It's a fascinating place. Winding street, fascinating shops. It's got an interesting atmosphere about it. Uh, but on the Tor itself, from the top, in the shadow of the Tower of, of the Church of St Michael, you look out at this enigmatic, captivating landscape. You know, this gentle, rolling, green landscape that is so synonymous with people's idea of a certain part of England. You know, and it's all there in the words of the hymn. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? You can understand why somebody there would be moved to compose words like those. It is that kind of place. It invites that kind of speculation. And even archaeologists and historians who go there hard-headed want to be scientific about it. You know, I've, I've been there with eminent historians and eminent archaeologists, and I won't name them, but off camera and, and in private, they're happy to speculate and to, and to concede that there is something inexplicable and romantic and alluring about Glastonbury. They might not write about it in their academic journals and, and they might not want to be heard saying it to camera in a television documentary, but it's the kind of place that it just makes you look around yourself and say, what if... Some say Pontius Pilate was born here before being whisked off to Rome and into the history books. The site of an ancient tree whose age is uncertain but likely old enough to make it the oldest living thing in Europe. Sitting in a beautiful glen that has always mattered to our ancestors. A tree and a place where it's possible to stand and mark the passage of time itself. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. Check out Neil Oliver Love Letter, the podcast's Instagram account. And to ensure you get each new episode of the podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe. Write a review and share with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book, it's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is taken care of by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>